AP 120, Chapter 3, the Topic Cell Membrane. So we are moving along the um, sizes up to organelles and cells. So we'll be talking about organelles and cells. So cell theory, so probably over 100 years ago, uh, is that the basic unit of life is the cell. So if something is alive, it must have at least one cell. So bacteria are alive because they are single-celled organisms. All living things made up of cells, animals, plants, bacteria, fungus, so on. And finally, cells arise from existing cells. So if you want a plant cell, it's going to come from an already existing plant cell, and so on. In human beings, we are composed of 75 trillion cells. 75 trillion cells, a huge number. And in these cells, almost all of them possess the exact same DNA in the nucleus. The DNA that codes for all the instructions that lead to the development of our cells. So we get nerve cells, cardiac cells, epithelial cells, and so on and so forth. So how do we get this diverse types of cells if it's all using the same DNA? Well, it turns out that each kinds of cell expresses different genes, different portions of the DNA that code for specific proteins. And there are approximately 30,000 genes in the human genome. And so while most cells are going to produce uh, proteins from certain genes, uh, individual cells like the nerve cell will have genes only expressed in nerve cells. Here is a cartoon of the cell from our textbook. Uh, I just wish to point out this is a cartoon model. It has a few things that are inaccurate, including relative size of organelles, colors. There's the cells aren't that colorful. And it shows on one cell a flagellum, microvilli, and cilia. You will never see all three of these structures in one cell. Matter of fact, you'll never see two of these structures on a single cell. A cell may have one of these, or it may have none of these. All right, so the cell gets broken down into three main components. You have the cell membrane, which is the outermost structure that defines the shape of the cell, and it separates the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell. Then you have the nucleus, a large organelle that houses the DNA, the genetic material. And then finally, everything that lies between the cell membrane and the nucleus. Everything in between there is referred to as the cytoplasm. This includes the fluids, the things dissolved in the fluids, and all of these organelles. So the cell membrane, here's a cartoon of the cell membrane. It is a double layer or bilayer made up of phospholipid molecules. So you can see here the phosphate head, the little fatty acid tails making up two sheets, two sheets forming the cell membrane. Again, separating the extracellular side, the outside, from the intracellular side or cytoplasmic side. So we get a close-up look of this phospholipid bilayer. Again, we see the phospholipids with their hydrophilic phosphate heads and the hydrophobic fatty acid tails. Hydrophobic, of course, meaning water feeling and hydrophilic meaning water loving which basically means that the hydrophobic tails avoid water do not dissolve in water are a barrier to many uh, polar things and the hydrophilic heads are in theory able to dissolve in water at the very least they like to be next to exposed to water and that of course means that the phospholipids are amphipathic is they have both a hydrophilic portion and a hydrophobic portion. Now that means that those fatty acid tails in the center of the phospholipid bilayer form a hydrophobic barrier that limits what can pass across the cell membrane. Again, here is just a view of the uh, phospholipid uh, its phosphate group, its glycerol portion, and the two fatty acid chains coming off of it. So that means that the cell membrane is able to engage in selective permeability. Some things can pass through it easy enough. So for instance, water can cross the membrane without a problem. 
Other things are blocked. Large molecules, for instance, cannot cross the phospholipid bilayer. Selective permeability. Now, there are other components that are very important for the function of the cell membrane. For instance, there are a lot of proteins, shown in purple, associated with the cell membrane. And you have a few different categories of proteins. You have integral proteins. Integral proteins are embedded in the cell membrane, either partially through or passing all the way through the cell membrane. Uh, Cell membrane proteins that pass all the way through are also called transmembrane proteins because they cross the membrane. And then there are also peripheral proteins. Peripheral proteins rest on the surface of the cell membrane. They are not embedded in it. There are also carbohydrate groups associated with the cell membrane. Uh, these carbohydrates are usually attached to other kinds of compounds. So we end up having things like glycoproteins, glyco for carbohydrate, proteins with carbohydrates attached to them, glycolipids, uh, carbohydrate groups attached to fatty acid chains. And these glycolipids and glycoproteins um, always have the carbohydrates facing toward the extracellular side. Also embedded within the cell membrane are these tiny, tiny little molecules. These are cholesterol molecules. And cholesterol is actually important for us. And we need a certain amount of cholesterol that will then uh, intercalate into the cell membrane and help give the cell membrane some additional rigidity. So we produce all the cholesterol we need, and it is, at the right levels, beneficial. Now, it turns out that some of the proteins or glycoproteins or glycolipids work together in some sort of function. And so they end up uh, forming what are called lipid rafts, just portions of the cell membrane that move around all together. But overall, uh, the cell membrane is not a static structure. It is almost a fluid. All the proteins and other molecules are constantly moving and moving around. And this is referred to as the fluid mosaic model. Fluid because everything's moving around, mosaic because you have these lipid rafts that stay together in that membrane. All right, cell membrane proteins. Cell membrane proteins, very important, and they have a lot of different functions. So one kind of function they can have is transportation. Uh, cell membrane proteins, these transmembrane proteins specifically, can provide a channel to allow materials to cross the cell membrane that normally cannot cross the cell membrane. Uh, cell membrane proteins can also be uh, structures that allow for intercellular connections. So proteins in the cell membrane of one cell can attach to proteins in the cell membrane of adjacent cells and hold those cells together. The uh, proteins within the cell membrane can also attach to internal structures of the cell, thereby anchoring those structures in certain areas in the cell. So for instance, the cytoskeleton, uh, which is long protein structures within the cell that help do things like give it its shape, they can attach to uh, cell membrane proteins. And cyto means cell. Cytoskeleton, skeleton of the cell. The uh, proteins can also be involved in cell-cell recognition. Specifically, these are the glycoproteins because the glyco part, the carbohydrate chains on the surface of a cell, allows immune cells to recognize our own cells and distinguish our cells from foreign cells. And that then allows our immune system to attack invading pathogens while avoiding damaging um, our own cells. A case where this is pretty important for more than just uh, immune response is blood types. Blood types help us make sure people uh, get the type of blood that their immune response will not attack. We wouldn't want that to happen if you get a blood transfusion. Then there's signal transduction. Uh, cell membrane proteins can uh, be receptors. So something 
can arrive, some sort of substrate, and it can bind to the receptor uh, that the transmembrane protein is producing, is forming, and then the binding of that uh, um, hormone, for instance, will lead to a signal that causes changes within the cell. So signal transduction, the transmembrane protein is a receptor, binds to something like a hormone, and this causes changes within the cell. And that is it for this portion of chapter three.